Welcome everyone, thanks for joining. Today on the Joseph Carlson Show, we have a very special show. In fact, I don't say this often at all. I really don't. But I think this one's gonna be a special show and I think you might wanna bookmark this video. In fact, out of the hundreds of videos I've done, this is probably one of the only ones that I think you should bookmark to eventually share with a friend or someone else that is getting started on the journey of building wealth or getting started on investing. I think it will be highly applicable either way. Now, the reason I say that is because what we're gonna be doing in this video is doing a basic overview of wealth building principles. We do so many things on YouTube where we get a little into the weeds. We talk about different news subjects and current events. We talk about different stocks and holdings in our portfolio. I've done multiple episodes, deep dives on companies like Apple, analysis on them and their valuation, or Microsoft. I've done entire episodes dedicated to Disney, Nike, Target, Costco. I've overviewed all of these companies in depth. And while I think it's good to do in-depth analysis on different companies that you're investing in and realize the portfolio that you're building, I also think it's good to take a step back and just go over some of the basics here. What I wanna cover in this video are some of the most basic foundational principles of wealth building. And I think this is both highly applicable to people that are far along in their investment journey and they're far along into building wealth and people just getting started. I think in any phase, it's really good to revisit this topic. So in this video, we're gonna be looking at three different graphics. These are flows cash flows, money flows, and how they affect the different ways that people build wealth. And I firmly believe that this is the most accurate representation of how you build wealth on YouTube. I literally believe that these three images really boil down what's the difference between wealthy households, poor households, and those that get kind of stuck in the in-between territory. This is it. So having said that, we have a lot of good stuff to jump into. So let's go ahead and start right off. First of all, my name is Joseph Carlson. I upload videos every single week of my portfolio. I give commentary on current events and my opinions on various subjects, as well as I do in-depth research on different companies that I'm buying into, and I give my bull case and bear case for different investments that people are talking about. Now, I've been doing this for quite a while. In fact, I uploaded my first video in February of 2019. It was a portfolio update. That's simply all it was. At the time, I had a $25,000 dividend growth portfolio. And at that point in time in social media, it was incredibly rare to show your entire portfolio transparently week by week. In fact, I don't know of anyone doing that very thing. And I thought, you know what? I bet a lot of people would like to see real investing complete transparency, no gimmicks, no hiding behind different walls. I thought that bringing this level of transparency to general finance would be a very positive thing. Well, it turns out my assumptions on that was correct. A lot of people turned out to really value seeing someone's financial journey tracked every single week. And so I kept doing it. I kept creating videos, sharing my opinion, and sharing how I view finance and investing in general. Now the channel's grown significantly. We've reached a size of over 240,000 subscribers. And along that process, in all 230 videos, I've shown you my portfolio transparently every single time. Both the portfolio value, the gains, and the money weighted return, which is the internal rate of return. In that, you can see the breakdown of my market gains, which is capital appreciation, and the earned dividends. So this is what I show and what you get to see week by week. And this makes it a lot of fun for me because I get to go through my investment journey, not alone. I get to go through it with a lot of other people. So I have a ton of support and a ton of help from both the community and the commenters here, as well as the many people on my Discord and in my Patreon. I can firmly say that I'm both a better investor and investing is a lot more fun in general because of social media. Now, having said that, I've stated many times previously that the purpose of this portfolio is to grow a stream of passive income. Passive income is completely different than active income. Active income is income you have to clock in for. You have to go to work. You have to respond to a job. You have a boss lecturing you on doing things. That's active income. Passive income is a stream of income that you do nothing for. It's completely passive. Warren Buffett famously said, if you do not find a way to earn money while you sleep, you will work until you die. That's a little bit grim of a statement, but that's his way of saying, you need to find a way to gain passive income. Now there's multiple ways of gaining passive income. Dividends aren't the only way, but dividends are certainly a great way to earn passive income. That's exactly what I did three years ago. 
I started building my portfolio and my first deposit was $2,000. I actually sold a little bit of my portfolio early on to pay down debt I owned on a car. So I've grown this portfolio from five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 back in 2018, all the way up to the value it's at right now. And I wanna help give context and explain how this happened with three different graphics. And the first one that we're gonna look at is the graphic showing the cash flows of poor households. Now, the first thing that I wanna address is nobody picks the circumstances you grew up in. That is just a roll of the dice. Some of us grow up in wealthy households, most of us might grow up in middle income households, right? Somewhere in between. And then some people, unfortunately, grow up in very poor households, very disadvantaged. You might have divorced parents. You might have only one parent working a single job at minimum wage. You might be struggling to get by in your family. There's people that can identify with that. Now, everybody's circumstances differ when they're growing up. And that is something that you can't control, the circumstances you grow up in. But the big lie here, the big thing that gets shared that's extremely discouraging is that because you grew up in a poor household, you can't transition to a wealthy household. I think you can do it, even if it's a more difficult task that has more hurdles. So let's go ahead and break this down. If you were to look at the financial cash flows of most people in poor households, this is what it would look like. You have right here off to the left, the earned income. This is not passive income, this is active income. Meaning, this is what you do when you go to your work. You try to earn income. And the reason that you get income in most cases, if you're a poor household, is to afford the expenses. Rent, utilities, cable, fuel, insurance, entertainment, and any unexpected expenses. That's where the huge majority of your money goes. And then if you have a dollar beyond that, almost always it will go to liabilities. Liabilities are things that also just suck money right out of your bank account. Cars are one of the biggest liabilities that you could ever buy. Dave Ramsey isn't correct on everything he says, but this is one thing that I certainly agree with him on. Cars end up keeping a lot of people poor. There's households that are already struggling with income. They make 35,000 a year, 40,000 a year for a family, right? That's not really enough to have a comfortable living, but then those same families in many cases will buy $70,000 trucks. It'll be more than their annual salary. I think it's actually crazy the amount that people spend on a car. I've made hundreds of thousands of dollars in a single year, and the most expensive car I've ever purchased is $27,000. That's how I view vehicles. I view them as black holes for money. And poor households, unfortunately, in many cases, buy cars that are extremely expensive. And of course, they don't pay for them in cash. They either lease them or they take out a big loan on them. And they pay monthly payments for sometimes up to seven years. Do you want to know where all that car money ends up? Let me go ahead and look at one of my holdings here. It's called JP Morgan. I've made $6,400 on this holding. This is where all that interest on these car loans is going. Right here, I have a dividend payment back in 2019 for $2.86. Not a lot of money, but I bought a little bit more of JP Morgan as time went on, and I bought a lot of it during the dip in 2020. Once I increased my holdings in it, now I'm getting $150 from JP Morgan, $150, $150, $133 as I sold a little bit when it really peaked out at a high price and $133. My next dividend payment is gonna be quite a bit more because I bought more of JP Morgan on a dip. But either way, you see these dividend payments coming in every single quarter. Every three months, I'm getting paid hundreds of dollars. I'm not paying the bank money, they're paying me money. And part of the reason is, is because of all the interest they get off of auto loans. Ally Bank is another company that makes a fortune based off of auto loans. Here's Ally Financial. We can actually look at the amount of dividends they're paying and where this money's coming from. If we scroll down and look at their dividends over time, you can see that this number is aggressively growing. Ally Financial is the biggest auto lender in the country. They make virtually all of their money on lending out money to people buying expensive vehicles. And they return that to shareholders in the form of dividends. These massive dividends that they pay every single quarter and they're aggressively raising every single quarter are in many cases being extracted from poor households that are buying more car than they can really afford. Realize the relationship here. The poor households are giving their money to rich investors buying these bank stocks. That's the relationship here. Now. That might paint an ugly picture, 
You might look at that and blame capitalism, but it's not a problem if you understand the relationship here. If you actually know what's going on, it makes it so that you can transition from this side of things to the other side of things. Once you actually understand how money works in the US and in the world, it makes it so that you actually change your behavior because you better understand where your cash flows should go. I understand that liabilities are not good for generating wealth. In fact, they're the biggest thing that deters people from accumulating wealth. They put money from your pocket into the pockets of wealthy investors. And just like we see the example of an expensive truck and the high interest payments you have to pay on it, we also see the flip side of that, where people are earning tons of money through dividends from stocks like JP Morgan Chase. And I'll also mention, the dividends aren't the only way that they're returning cash to the shareholder. So you might only see this and say, all right, well, he's getting $150 every quarter. That's pretty cool. But you got to remember, JP Morgan doesn't just do dividends. They also do an incredible amount of share buybacks. They buy back billions and billions of their stock, which has the effect of pushing up the stock price. This again is another tool they use with all the cash they're extracting from many people paying interest that makes investors wealthy. This is the reason why not only do I make money in dividends from JP Morgan, but I'm also $6,000 in the green in capital appreciation. On both sides, I'm making money with this company. If you look at the poor household cash flow, it is a very difficult one to break. I think this is by far the most difficult because unfortunately, the people that are in poor households typically have a low earned income. They're not earning a lot of money to begin with. And so most of that money is eaten up by basic expenses. So you don't have a lot of discretionary money to work with. And then in almost every case, beyond the expenses, beyond the basic things to survive, the extra cash is added to liabilities. In this type of situation, like I said, it is the most difficult one to break out of, but I still think it can happen. The big thing that needs to happen is first of all, in any way possible, trying to increase the earned income. Whether that means going to a coding boot camp, whether that means trying to get into a job or you have some upward potential. Even low income jobs in many cases have some type of upward potential. For instance, almost everyone that owns a Domino's franchise has worked at Domino's. Almost every one of them of the tens of thousands. So there are some opportunities. Always look for a job that has upward room for growth. If you're working in a job that has no room for growth anywhere, you're never gonna make more money, you're never gonna grow your income, and you're not already at a very high income with that job, it's not worth it. You should move jobs even taking a little bit less current income if it has an upward trajectory. When you're working, especially early on in your career, you always wanna work at a job that has some kind of upward potential. Never stay complacent with your job. If you're doing that and you're already on a track to have some type of upward potential and you also wanna earn extra income, you can look for other type of side gigs. I know lots of people that do DoorDash, they do Uber Eats, you know, there's lots of different things in the gig economy that you can earn some extra cash. But once you've tried to increase your cash flow at all as much as possible, that won't solve this issue. Because if you increase cash flow and then you let that cash flow go to liabilities, you haven't done anything. You haven't accomplished anything there. The earned income needs to increase and it needs to be redirected towards assets. That is how you break out of this cycle. You have to start directing earned income to assets. If you have a lower income and you don't have a stock portfolio, then $350,000 in that scenario is gonna look insurmountable. It'll look like you can never achieve this type of portfolio. But that's not the attitude that you should have. If you start investing in any capacity, you'll eventually get to this point. I can almost guarantee that with enough time, you will get to this point and far surpass it. Remember that I started my portfolio with a $100 deposit back in 2017. Then I started to put in more money as I got more excited about investing. I remember the feeling when I was first getting these dividend payments, 69 cents from Visa. That was one of the first dividend payments, 69 cents. Then I got 64 cents, 30 cents, 35 cents. I got one cent, 36 cents, and so on. I was getting pennies, but it struck me. This was something special. I was getting paid money passively, real money, real cash that I could use for whatever I want that was passive. And even though the actual values were, uh, were minuscule, these are tiny values, it was the principle that struck me. I realized that this is real. These companies 
are powerful economic machines that will return money to you over and over and over again. And all you have to do is take this same principle and do it more and more. You have to find ways to deposit money into your portfolio and buy these assets. And luckily now, almost every brokerage has some form of fractional shares, meaning that even if you have $50 a month, 50 bucks a month to spare, you could start a portfolio. So there's not really any excuses anymore. If you have any earned income whatsoever, you can put a little bit of that into assets. And whether or not that's $50 a month that you earn from doing DoorDash, whether or not it's $100 a week, but at any degree, I recommend getting started, starting to build up assets at any degree. Because establishing that pattern and that behavior early on of continually depositing money into assets I think is vital to be able to break this loop. If I kept my first job and never grew my earned income, I would likely still be in the poor household loop. I would have a very difficult time breaking this cycle because my earned income was very low at the time. I had an earned income of $12 an hour and my first job was working as a customer support agent where I answered phone calls and emails. It was not a glamorous job. It didn't come with good benefits. And the $12 an hour I think was okay pay at the time. I remember getting a 50 cent raise to 1250 and being very excited about that. In my mind, I thought that pays for my lunch every day. That was my first job out of high school about 12 years ago. Now I've been able to dramatically increase my earned income over time through a lot of maneuvering from job to job and learning different skill sets. The big skill set that I learned, the most valuable one, was how to code. Learning to code is an extremely valuable skill set in the future, and I think it will continue to be for at least the next 30 years. If you're considering a way to dramatically increase your income, and you like working on computers, learning to code is certainly something you can do, and all the information to do it is available for free online. All you have to have is a laptop, an internet connection, and an incredible drive to learn how to code. Those are the three necessary ingredients. But once I learned how to code, my income started to go up, then I started the YouTube channel and did both of those at the same time and the income has since increased. This is how you move from this phase to the next phase. You try to find any way possible to increase your earned income. Now we're on to the next phase, the quote unquote rich households. You might notice that rich is within those quotation marks because they're rich, but they're not wealthy. And in many cases, people in this phase of life or in this category of cash flow are no better than the poor households. They are not in much better of a financial situation. Let me go ahead and explain why. First of all, they have a higher earned income. So you might be saying, Joseph, how are they no better if they have a higher earned income? Well, again, let me explain why. Even though they're earning more money, so they might have gotten a raise or they might have switched jobs or let's say they learned how to code and now they're making uh, $100,000 a year. They're no longer making $40,000 a year. Now you're making $85,000, dollars $100, $120,000 a year and you feel good about yourself. You're raking in all kinds of money. That money though, unfortunately, is doing what most people do. It's being spent in a very stupid way that will never grow wealth. The majority of people in this category that are high income earners have some of their money go to expenses, they have a home, they have maintenance, they have utilities and fuel and insurance and entertainment and some unexpected expenses. Those are the basic expenses to live. Well, they make a lot of money, so the expenses really don't eat away at the majority of their budget. But just like the poor households, whenever they get extra cash, which they now have, they maintain that same mentality of having a poor household. All the extra income, instead of going into assets, is funneled into liabilities. And the liabilities grow exponentially. Instead of just having a basic home or a small place that they live at with a mortgage and a cheap car to be able to get them from their work and back. They buy a huge expensive home. They buy an extra home. They buy multiple vehicles. They're buying the new Teslas. They're talking about the new models of all the different Teslas. They're getting the highest models that are the most expensive and they're showing them off on social media. This is what rich households do. They show off all of their toys. They have boats. They have RVs. They have lots of stuff. Unfortunately, these are all in the liability categories. Every single one of these things depreciates over time. Autos are very expensive. As you can see just from the price of them, if you're buying an old fashioned vehicle, not one of the newer electric vehicles, then those cars depreciate very quickly. In seven years, they just lose their value like crazy. 2020 was one of the only unique years where they went up in value. Outside of that anomaly, cars are incredibly expensive to lease 
and to maintain. And in terms of EVs being so much cheaper than ICE vehicles, that's not really true. People that are buying Teslas are paying a lot for them. And to buy the full self-driving feature is like an extra $12,000. Cars, again, I believe are the biggest culprit in eating away at your wealth. But they're not the only thing. There's other liabilities people buy. Other things that go down in value, they have one-time use, people spend a fortune on them, and unfortunately, they create zero wealth this way. So you may have made the assumption that it's the poor households that are funding all the dividends and all the buybacks of all these different companies that end up making investors very wealthy. And that is true to some extent. Poor households certainly do that, but it's far more the case with rich households. Because as you can see from the cash flows here, rich households have the exact same cash flows, except they're working with far more money. So they're basically using the exact same blueprint as poor households, but now they have an upgrade in pay. Their money's not working for them, it's working against them. And unfortunately, with all the liabilities that they're paying for, all of that stuff, again, makes investors incredibly wealthy. People in rich households buy huge homes and they do lots of home projects. Well, take a look at this. I own a company called Home Depot that takes advantage of all the rich households that love to do their home projects, and that company returns that money to me in the form of dividends. I get paid a quarterly dividend from Home Depot that's continually growing without me actually contributing any more money. Do you know where rich people tend to shop? They love this place called Costco. You may have heard of it. The average home income for someone that shops at Costco is above 100,000 a year. It has a very wealthy shopper base. Costco also happens to be one of my biggest holdings that continually pays me dividends and occasionally these huge special dividends. You can also see that I've made some money in capital appreciation on this company, nearly $10,000 just on this holding alone. Rich households aren't really rich at all. What they do is they fund wealthy investors. That's what happens with their money. And since they have a higher income level, since they're making over 100,000 a year, they're just funding wealthy investors at a much higher pace than poor households. But in reality, their cash flows match. They're doing the exact same thing that poor households do. They're stuck in the exact same loop. And if they continue this way, they will never be able to retire. They will always 100% be reliant on earned income. And they'll always be shackled to their high earned income. That's an extremely stressful situation to be in. Always being forced to earn a ton of money to pay for all your liabilities and expenses. In my opinion, I'd rather just earn less money and own less stuff. So obviously we don't wanna be in the poor household category and we also don't wanna be in the quote unquote rich household category. And that's a little bit of a contrarian thing to say because this is supposed to be the category that you envy, that you're supposed to want to be in and it's really not. This is not the category you wanna be in. This next category of the wealthy households, I think is the single best illustration of the fundamental shift that needs to take place in your cash flows, the way that your money flows in order for you to generate and grow and sustain wealth. This is truly wealthy households. On first appearance, these people might not even look wealthy, but in reality, they have way more wealth than the rich households. Look at the way that their cash flows work. First of all, they do earn an income, but notice the line going from earned income to expenses is very small. There's only one dollar symbol here, suggesting that they keep their expenses minimal. People that are truly wealthy, they keep their expenses minimal. They don't like paying for homes. They don't like paying for maintenance. They don't like expensive things because they understand the relationship of finance. And the biggest single distinguishment here is that people that are wealthy, truly wealthy, do not put their extra earned income into liabilities. They don't like buying new cars. They use old used cars. They don't like buying second homes and vacation homes and three different high-end trucks and Teslas and that type of things because they understand money. They understand the relationship here. They know that the extra homes go to fund wealthy investors for JP Morgan. They know that the three auto loans for the big trucks and Tesla go to fund Ally Bank. They know that spending all their money at Costco or Amazon is returned to shareholders of Costco and Amazon in the forms of dividends or capital appreciation. They know that when they do extensive remodelings of their home or yard projects, it's returned to shareholders in the forms of dividends from Home Depot and Lowe's. Wealthy people understand this relationship, so they do not pour their earned income into liabilities. Rather, their earned income, by and large, flows into assets. 
Assets are things that gain value over time and they have a tendency to pay current income. The two best asset categories by far are real estate and stocks. Those are the two biggest ones. Real estate, everyone knows, has a tendency to make people wealthy over long periods of time. If you own rental properties, you have so many benefits. You have the benefits of depreciation, which helps with taxes. You have the benefits of them being real assets that work as an inflation hedge. You have the benefits of capital appreciation, meaning they go up in value over time. And you have the benefits of current income as you collect rent from them. So real estate and rental properties have an incredible amount of benefits all packed into one investment. And they have a tendency to make people very, very wealthy. You probably haven't met too many people that have been doing real estate investing for a long period of time that haven't made a lot of money doing it. The other category is stocks. And stocks is another way of saying equity, ownership, having ownership in a company. Everybody that becomes extremely wealthy either has done it typically through real estate or through owning a business. You look at people like Bill Gates with Microsoft, Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook, Jeff Bezos with Amazon, and so on and so forth. The way that people grow wealth is by having a stake, an ownership in a company. And stocks are just a name, a term, to be able to describe the public being able to buy ownership in companies. Stocks, like real estate, are both assets. They both generate wealth over time, but they do it in a very different way. For instance, real estate is typically concentrated. You spend a lot of money on one single place. Well, stocks can be incredibly diversified. You can buy a variety of stakes in different companies so that if anything happens to one of them, it doesn't damage your overall portfolio. Stocks are also incredibly liquid, meaning that you can buy and sell them every single day, five days a week, where real estate really isn't as liquid. You can't buy and sell it every single day, every hour. So stocks have different benefits and different downsides, but overall they're both assets and they both play an important role. And many stocks, like rental properties, pay you current income. That's in the form of dividends. That income is incredibly important. I refer to that income as passive income. Unlike your active income that you have to work for and clock in for, passive income means that you make it while you sleep. And even though you might have to work a little bit to manage a rental property, in the form of a dividend portfolio, you really don't have to work at all. You really don't have to do anything. You buy a stake in a good dividend paying company and you just hold it. That is true passive income and it's completely real. So far I've earned almost $13,000 in this passive income just over the course of the past three years. And that amount is accelerating. Every single year it goes up and up. The biggest distinction that wealthy households do is they don't spend any of their active income on liabilities. They avoid this entirely. They funnel all of their earned income into assets. Whether that's buying rental properties or dividend paying stocks or stocks that are doing aggressive buybacks and have a high return on invested capital, whatever the case may be, the things they buy differ for every wealthy household but in aggregate, they all have this in common. They're all funneling all of their discretionary income into assets. Those assets pay passive income in the forms of rent and dividends, and that passive income gets funneled right back into assets. And that is where you get a dramatic compounding effect. When you have this compounding effect of the assets generating passive income, and then that passive income being reinvested back into buying more assets, that is a snowball that gets formed. And then you have an additional stream of income funding these assets, which works as an extra catalyst. That's your earned income. So now you have dual streams of income funding your assets. And that's really where you get this snowball working. Over and over again, the cycle goes. Assets generating passive income, passive income buying more assets. Earned income that you're working for, buying more assets, which helps generate more passive income, so on and so forth. Eventually, this cycle leads to a lot of wealth. That is the end outcome every single time. When it happens or how it happens can vary from investor to investor. It differs because earned incomes are different and investment decisions are different. But if you have any earned income that you can put into investments and you make wise investment decisions and you get attractive returns, this will eventually happen. For every single person, it will eventually happen. And once the assets grow to a large enough size, you start actually surpassing your earned income with your passive income. You might notice that in this illustration, the passive income has $3 symbols and their active income has $2 symbols. 
That is typical in a really wealthy household. You might ask them, where do you get your money from? Where does it come from? They're gonna say, I have a lot of money that comes in through this business I own. I have a lot of employees. They're gonna say, I have a big portfolio of dividend paying assets. They pay me out every single month and every quarter. They're gonna say, I have a lot of real estate properties that I collect rent from. Once they get to this point of being truly wealthy and having so much assets that it generates an enormous amount of passive income, they no longer have to answer, I get the majority of my money from my nine to five. So when I look through these three different cash flows, I really think this is the best illustration that separates poor households from quote unquote rich households from the truly wealthy households. The true wealthy class that enjoys not having to work every single day for the money that they spend. This is the biggest thing that separates it. And I really think that the more we understand the fundamentals of how this works, the better shot we have of moving from the poor and the rich households into the wealthy household. Everyone has different situations and circumstances. Some people are more advantaged in this scenario, some people are more disadvantaged, but I truly believe that most of us have a very good shot of transitioning to this wealthy household category. We have a huge support system here with YouTube and social media. There's lots of people willing to support and help other people understand this and be able to make this transition. Whether it comes with earning higher amounts at your job, finding different ways to earn money, lowering your liabilities, and transitioning your cash flows from liabilities to assets. There's people that can help with every phase of it. So on my channel, on my videos, week by week, you see me building my portfolio and depositing income. I also do in-depth analysis on the companies that I'm buying. I'm trying to get very attractive returns on my capital and make my money work as hard for me as possible. So I do extensive research on every single investment that I'm investing in. I've done multiple videos on Apple and Microsoft and done in-depth analysis so that I make sure I understand these companies. And I share that information publicly for free. I've also done in-depth analysis on all of these companies, entire videos on Costco and Disney and Home Depot, and understanding their business model and how they generate wealth. And while all that information is good, I think it's important from time to time to step back and realize the most important thing going on here. The most important thing I'm doing by far is my cash flows. I'm putting my money in my portfolios. I'm choosing to buy productive assets instead of tacking on liability after liability. I'm not buying Teslas. I'm not buying $70,000 trucks. Like I've said, the most expensive vehicle I've ever bought is $27,000. And the reason why is because I'm laser focused on moving into that wealthy category. That is my goal. I wanna get to the point where this passive income pays for my lifestyle, where I earn enough money in dividends and I have a big enough portfolio that that's what I'm reliant on to be able to go and enjoy the things I wanna do. Because in my opinion, the people in the rich household category are not rich at all. Being reliant on your active income is not a fun situation to be in. And truly rich people, the ones in the wealthy category, are the ones that have it made. They're the ones that have freedom, they have autonomy, they can do whatever they want with their time. They wake up and decide what they wanna do during the day. And that's the goal of where I wanna be. So that's my thoughts for today. And I hope you don't mind me not sharing news on current events or anything like that. I wanted to revisit these basic wealth building principles because I really think that this has the most impact and can change people's lives the most out of everything that we basically talk about here. So that's my thoughts. I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you in the next one.